before the Lord today in prayer, I would ask that you would uh, remember those in our community, those in our, our families uh, who have requested prayer and the Lord's healing touch in their situations and also our world situations. But ultimately, that the Lord be glorified, that he make his will known, and that he will be with us to lead us and guide us. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you today in worship. And the greatest desire we have is that you would be glorified. That in everything we do, everything that we say, everything that we sing, everywhere that we go, that we would glorify you, that we would point to you. Lord, in the, in the situations in our world, we think of the Eurasia region, we think of military conflicts worldwide, we think of the, the battles between people, the, the explosions, the, the violence. And Lord, we know that even in that, that you can be glorified, because Lord, we just lift up the people. Lord, as your people, we know that you have called us to pray for each other, to bear each other's burdens, to forgive one another, that our focus would be on you and not on this world. Lord, help us to focus on you. Lord, for those who are ill, we ask that you would lend your healing touch, that you would uh, come alongside the medical professionals. Lord, we think of, of Deborah Zonker, we think of Eileen, we think of Marvin's sister, we think of Gary. And what, Lord, we just ask that, that you would come to the medical professionals, that you would bless them for the knowledge that they've gained, <laughs> the experience that they've had, that you would guide them, that you would give them wisdom and discernment. But Lord, we know that, that human healing is temporary, that human healing is powerless and worthless when compared to you. And so Lord, we just ask that you would bring your healing to them, that you would go to them where they are, that you would lend your touch to their body, that they would be healed completely. And Lord, that in that, that you would be glorified. And now Lord, as we, as we turn our attention to the rest of this worship service, we have the same prayer, that we would glorify you with our words, glorify you with our songs, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would guide us when we leave this place to live as your people and to glorify you. We ask all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue worship in song. first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Uh, we have looked specifically at the, the seven letters to the seven churches mentioned 
in chapter 2 and 3. And that brings us today to our text in Revelation 3, starting in uh, verse 14, the church at Laodicea. And, and as I looked at that, I see a call to action is, is what I have uh, titled this, because we are called to hear, to listen, and to act. But, but just to kind of uh, bring us up to speed, we had uh, the letter to the church at Ephesus, the church that had endured hardships, the church that would um, had stayed steadfast, but had left the love they had at first, and, and the call to Jesus to repent, to turn back, to come back. We had the, the letter to the church at Smyrna, uh, that Jesus said, I know your afflictions and your trials. I, I know what's going on. I know the accusations that have been leveled against you. I know that you're poor, but you are rich in what matters. We had the, the letter to the church of Pergamos. They were commended for their longtime faithfulness. But then it was pointed out that they had allowed some of the world to, to creep in some of the, the worldly values to, to water down the gospel and again a call to come back. With the letter to the church at Thyatira, they were commended for their love, their faith, their service, their perseverance. But again, Jesus points out, they've allowed someone to lead them into sinful practice and they're urged to come back. We had the, the letter to the church at Sardis. The dead and decaying church with just a few faithful left. And again, the reminder to come back, to repent, to turn around. Last week, we looked at the letter to the church at Philadelphia, the patient church. They were small, but patient. They were faithful to remain true to the gospel. And, and this week, we have the seventh and final letter sent to the church of Laodicea. Now, each of these places um, are real places. Each of these places were well-known cities. They were centers where people gathered. They were um, big churches. They were powerful, influential churches. Uh, some have, have theorized. Uh, some scholars have looked at these um, and, and said, well, they're not just simply letters sent to those people at those times. But, but that it says that this is to the churches, plural. That, that the word is to be spread, to be, to be sent, so that not only those churches, but that all could, could benefit. Some scholars have theorized that each of these churches represent not just the people at that time and that place, but maybe um, time periods in human history where the church has at one point or another embraced heresy or sin or, or been watered down. The church is small but mighty. The church has been persecuted. And there have been some who theorize that this is about the ages of the church, the, the different stages that we have gone through um, as believers. Um, and then some that, that, that think that this is a combination of all of that, 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 that the word of God applies um, then between then and now, and now. And, and that's kind of where I fall is, um, it's hard for me to point to a particular verse and say, this is the verse where we are. Some have asked me in the last few weeks with the uh, events going on between the Russian and Ukrainian border. Pastor, is this uh, end times? Is this somewhere in the book of Re Revelation? Are we getting close to when Jesus comes back? Are we getting close to, to when uh, our salvation will be realized, when the new heaven and new earth will be established, when all wrongs will be made right, when, when death and sin and hurt will all be abolished. Um, yes, we are getting closer every single day. Can I point to a particular verse or a particular date on the calendar? No, I cannot. Um, Jesus said, um, it is not for anyone to know. He said, even the son does not know, but only the father. And so uh, uh, I want to warn you that anybody that says, hey, if you read your Bible, you will find in chapter this and verse that, that this directly matches up. Um, uh, maybe, but not necessarily a, a, a prescription. No, it's not necessarily a timeline as, as we understand it. So I want to caution you about that, but also to realize that yes, 
these events are bringing us closer and closer and closer to Jesus coming back. Now, um, the, the, these uh, words in Revelation, uh, they were written by John the Apostle, uh, John the Beloved, the author of the Gospel of John. But they're not his words. It's uh, not as the, the letters of Paul or, or Paul writing things down, but these actually um, were given to John by the Lord Jesus himself. He writes in Revelation 1.10, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So, so this revelation is not um, simply John's words or John's interpretation, but he was instructed, write this down. Send it out. Make sure that it is read. And that this message came from Jesus himself. John writes in the, the prologue to Revelation, starting in Revelation 1.1, he writes these words. This is the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Soon, as in God's timeline. Soon, not as in my timeline, like lunch is coming soon but in God's timeline, to show him what soon must take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, the author, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, so we've been looking at these words that, that, that were revealed and given, these things that were shown and told to John to send to the churches and to be set out. Now, we've seen in each of these uh, letters, each of these sections, that there are some commonalities, that each is addressed to an angel at the church, a caretaker or caretakers, uh, maybe a, a bishop of that particular region or, or people in charge or, uh, in our local church polity that might uh, be our local church board or um, our district advisory board, which is made up of pastors to run our district or our board of general superintendents. We're meeting right now. And so um, this is sent to the, the people that make decisions, the people that lead. Okay, um, We've seen that, that each of these letters names a specific church and a specific community in the ancient world, each being well known. Each starts with an identification of Christ as the originator, addressed to the angel from Jesus. And then a statement of the present conditions of the church accolades, rebuke, correction, reminders, and a call to attention, often a call to repent. Each starts with, I know, Jesus says, I'm familiar with, I have, I have seen, I have heard. Um, uh, uh, one mentions, uh, I am the one who walks among the churches, I am with you, I am, I am watching, I'm caring, I'm involved. Each ends um, with a promise to the one who is victorious and then a closing uh, demand or command. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, indicating that each individual person has a choice. Each is to consider the message. Each is to consider how to apply it to our own life, to consider the, the praise and the correction to ponder whether there is something in our own life or in our own uh, circle of influence, our own Christian walk with Jesus, that we need to adjust and to trust Jesus to accept us and to help us make that correction and adjustment. We are assured that the time is at hand, that, it, that it's coming soon, but that there is still a small amount of time. There, there is encouragement in, in knowing that Jesus knows our situation. You know, so many times um, when, when you go to uh, someone who is supposed to be in charge, whether that's a, a person figure or whether that's um, a board or a group of people, um, it is so reassuring to hear, I know. I know about it. It's okay, I know. I'm working on it. I'm dealing with it. Sometimes, uh, I don't know about you, but I sometimes get impatient. 
when I go to someone above me, one of my superiors or someone in charge, and I say, um, did you know that there's, there's this situation and I feel like you need to act? And I'm told, yes, I know, I'm working on it. I think, darn, I, did, I missed that. I, I missed the, that you were working on that. But, but it's both encouraging and, and maybe a little bit scary to hear from Jesus. I know all about you. I know where you're at. I've been watching been paying attention. I care. And I'm in this situation. I'm involved here. I'm working here. It's all right. I know. And, and for those of us who, who try to walk with Jesus daily or, or every moment, that's, that's both reassuring. And sometimes when we, when we hear some correction from Jesus, just to be honest, um, it's not very comfortable, is it? So sometimes when the Lord says, I know all about it, and, and let me show you this area that, that needs a little bit of change. Let me work on this. Sometimes that is uncomfortable, but knowing that Jesus knew about it to start with, still accepts us, still loves us, is reassuring. You know, um, Paul asks rhetorically in, in Romans 8, 31, Paul, Paul writes, if God is for us, who can be against us? And of course, the answer is nobody. If God is for us, and he is, God is for us, who can be against us? You know, Jesus uh, gives us the assurance that he's quoted in Matthew 18, 20, saying, where two or three gather together as my followers in my name, I am there among them. I'm with you. Wow, doesn't, doesn't that realization when we're, when we're in some type of uh, a situation where we're a little apprehensive or, or we're sensing some danger or some trouble or we're not sure what to do, to just hear from the Lord, I know I'm with you. It may not, it may not be pleasant for you, but I am with you. you know, sometimes we sing the song, He is here. He is here, hallelujah, right? He is here, amen. He is here, holy, holy. I will bless his name again. Isn't that comforting to know? He is here. Now, now as we get into um, the specifics of today's text at Laodicea, if you would, would uh, turn there to Revelation 3 starting in verse 14, but realize that Jesus knows that he's here, that, that he wants um, us, that he wants the best for us, he loves us, he knows that he speaks only truth. Um, one thing that everybody in the ancient world that saw this letter would know is that Laodicea is, a, is another center of commerce, a center of trade. It's a mix of cultures and influences. The, the actual town of Laodicea is the farthest inland of any of the, the seven churches written. It's, uh, it's at a crossroads. So as you're going inland, you would, you would stop at Laodicea and then disperse. Or if you're coming to the coast, you would go from wherever you are and, and you, would, you would come to Laodicea and then you might take one fork or another or, or travel to the coast. And so, um, uh, you know, we used to, uh, my family used to every once in a while travel west and we would take I-70 and then there's a point where it's the last stop for gas, coffee, and a restaurant. You know what I'm talking about? And you stop, don't you? Make sure you're full of gas. You know, maybe there's even a, a sign as we're driving. You know, next services so many miles. Plan ahead. Okay, uh, those signs are useful to me. Now we've got GPS, we've got maps, we've got Hey Siri, show me the nearest gas station, or Hey Siri, how far is it to the nearest Loves or Kids? Oops, she's gonna beep at me. You know, and and, and it's like one stand. It's about sixty-eight miles. There we go. <laughs> about sixty-eight miles. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, but but that was that's Laodicea. Okay. Um, Laodicea is a is a weird giant truck stop on the way out or the way in. And it's a place where you're driving. And you think, well, who in the world would put a truck stop there? But we better pull over. Hopefully, it's one of those with the nice big clean restrooms. And 
automatic sinks and touchless soap. And, uh, that's my favorite kind where you don't have to touch the door, the soap, the, the sink, nothing. You don't touch anything. Those are great. We try to keep track of those and stop at those. So um, Laodicea was also a banking center. They were known for, for trading in black wool, but also known as uh, a banking center and also as a center for ophthalmology, which is, is eye doctor. So um, I don't know how often you go to the eye doctor, but that's where the eye doctor was. So if we look at the, the text, those are things that, that everybody would know about Laodicea. That, that they have doctors, they have um, banking, which means they're rich. Everybody knows bankers are rich, right? They've got all the money. Yeah. Um, they, they actually hold all the money themselves in their pockets, right? No. But it's a banking center, okay? So, so John writes this in Revelation 3, verse 14. And I'm reading today from the, the New American Standard Bible, but uh, all translations are good and valid. But he writes this. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Some translations say, I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's pretty violent. Verse 17, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be jealous, zealous, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him, and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as we, as we kind of tear that apart a little bit, um, there are some very literal things there and there are some figurative things there. There's some things that I think we can apply to uh, our own situation and things that, that we can maybe be careful not to fall into. Um, the starting with uh, the first part, um, we have the, the, this is the amen, the final, the ending. Okay? Um, amen also uh, is sometimes translated as let it be so or truthfully truly let it happen at the end of uh, of prayer that that's our uh, affirmation and our confirmation and, and this says that that jesus is the last the end the true and faithful witness and then we read the beginning of the creation of god now i, I want to make something clear um, the, the church, and I'm talking global church, has already dealt with um, this phrase, and some people are misled where uh, they think that maybe the beginning of the creation of God, that phrase, or some translations say the origin of the creation of God indicates that Jesus was created first. That is incorrect. That's wrong. Um, it was called the Arian Controversy. You can look it up. That there were a group of people following um, a, a bishop who says that uh, they thought that, that God was singular, not three in one, a trinity, as we know to be true, but, but God was singular and that God created Jesus, the Son, that he was first created. That's incorrect. But, but this is more of, a, of an affirmation that uh, as we read in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it does not say in the beginning God created first Jesus, then the heavens and the earth. That is incorrect. That, that Jesus was already in existence before the creation. Uh, the Gospel of John 1-1 um, kind of gives us some light in that. It reads, in the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, in the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made 
that was made. Everything was created through Jesus. We also have a, a reminder that not only was everything created through him, but, but that at his second coming, he will be the end, the amen, the final. So the beginning and the end, or the, the alpha and the omega is a phrase that we sometimes read um, in Revelation. We also um, have a, a reminder there about some lukewarmness. Now, um, lukewarm is an interesting thing. I, I made a special... Uh, pot of coffee for us, and no one tried any of it. Had the had the sign for for those of you who did not see the sign, I put up this sign that says um, Laodicea Coffee Blend today only, freshly brewed last night, boiled, then allowed to naturally and gently age overnight to cool to room temperature. It is neither hot nor cold. Now, for those of us who like our coffee, I, I like it hot. I like it cold and iced. That's fine, too. Um, now, uh, Judy and I were just talking. I can tolerate room temperature. I kind of learned to deal with it. It's all right. It's not my favorite. I'm not, I'm not going to die. <laughs> but when someone says, would you like a nice, hot, fresh cup of coffee, and they hand it to me, and it's kind of lukewarm and cool, I go, oh, Gee, thanks. And I politely gulp it down. And I'll tell you if I if I stop at a convenience store when I'm traveling and I and I pour some coffee out of the out of the thing and it doesn't steam, I tend to kind of bring it up toward my cheek. And if it don't, if it doesn't feel hot, I, I take a little sip. And if it's cold, I pour it out. Get some hot. I don't know anybody that, that goes up to the coffee pot after it's been sitting all night and pours it out and says, "Ah, oh, perfect temperature, just the way I like it." 70 degrees, old, thick, chunky. That's great. I love that. I hope it goes clop, clop, clop as I'm drinking it. I don't know anybody that likes that. But Jesus says that these people, they're not hot, they're not cold, they're lukewarm. Now, um, again, uh, this coffee would be much better if I heated it up for a minute in the microwave or if I added ice cubes. As it is, it's just kind of tolerable. Jesus says, I don't like it. Now, now this reference is not only um, uh, something that, that we can experience, but the people at Laodicea would know exactly what a reference to lukewarm meant. See, um, the one fault of the city, the actual city of Laodicea, is that it was um, founded at the crossroads and not at a uh, geographically advantageous position. Basically, they, they were not put in a good place. They didn't build at a good place to build a city because they did not have um, enough water locally. They didn't have a consistent supply of fresh water to sustain the occupants. They actually piped in water from the south. Now, um, a short distance to the south is uh, Colossa. Uh, Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians, which is our, our book of Colossians. Um, they had hot springs, so their hot water was piped all the way to Laodicea, but it wasn't hot when it got there. It's kind of lukewarm. Now, um, uh, the uh, the other nearby city um, was known for its cool, fresh springs, its cooling waters for travelers. But that wasn't Laodicea either. See, they, they didn't have it hot, they didn't have it cold. That was their neighbors. And, and, the, the application here, the, the implication here is that the church is just like that. They didn't have enough refreshing, healing, powerful hot water. They didn't have any cold water. It was kind of lukewarm. Now, the Christians were kind of the same. They, they weren't on fire for Jesus, just dripping with Jesus everywhere they go. Have you ever met one of those people where, where when you're in their presence, you leave and you feel better? It's like, like the Holy Spirit in me is so happy to see the Holy Spirit in you that we all just feel great. That would be on fire for Jesus. Or, or the other way, 
People who are absolutely cold, shut down, have absolutely no use at all. And sometimes you meet those people and you think, well, I can, I can let the Holy Spirit in me overcome that. I can, I can insulate myself so I don't cool off. But when you, when you find someone that's kind of lukewarm, I, I run into those kinds of people all the time. And I don't, I don't mean to gossip about people, but here's kind of how it goes. Um, when I meet someone for the first time and, and I mention that I am a pastor, they're very quick to tell me, um, I grew up in church. I know all about church and Jesus, and, uh, and I read the Bible all the time, Pastor, and, and I pray uh, regularly and all the time, but I, I, I don't, I don't say, well, great, so do you have a church? No, I just don't attend church. You know, I kind of, well, it's not because I'm against it necessarily. I just kind of, uh, you know, I say, yeah, I know. And I think that's that lukewarm. That's, that's coffee that's, that's not really hot. And it's not really cold either. It's just, yeah. Now, when we're, when we're thinking about uh, maybe uh, a person or a group of people, I don't know if you know anybody kind of like that, but you think, you were on fire. You were, you were amazing. You were doing great things. You were walking with Jesus. That you were in communion with him all the time. You were together. You were doing great things and you just kind of fell off. It's not that we quit believing. We just kind of fell out of the habit. We got busy. And, and that happens. Sometimes we get busy with, with sports or following our kids around. Uh, that's not sinful. But it is if it makes you cool off. Uh, it's not a sin to go fishing. It's not a sin to sleep in. It's not a sin to go on vacation or go to the lake or to travel. That's not sinful stuff. But if it causes you to cool off toward God, maybe you ought to reconsider. Because Jesus says, uh, you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one of those. If you were hot, we can, we can deal with that. We can, we can enjoy hot coffee or hot soup or hot cocoa or hot tea. Um, you know, that's great. Or a hot, fresh hamburger, fresh off the grill, you know, or one of those restaurants where they serve the fajitas and they're still sizzling. You can hear them coming and you go, ooh, that's neat. It looks good. It smells good. It sounds good. It's kind of moving around on the plate there. Or, or, or ice cold, we can deal with that. But when it's in the middle, we need, to, we need to either warm it or cool it. You know, we have uh, um, standards when we go to a restaurant. If they bring out your hot food and it's been sitting there for an hour or two or three, just sitting there on the counter, are you happy to have it? No. You might take a bite of it and say, yeah, that's okay. But then, like Jesus says, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth because... Yuck! I don't like it. Now, I don't. I, I don't want to push. I don't want this to sound like like we're gossiping about people. So I'm just going to let that kind of cool down for a little while. Just let that kind of sit and cool off to, to room temperature. Okay, but Leo, Laodicea was a big church. The city was full of money. They were stinking rich. Um, the, the city was actually destroyed by an earthquake in, in 72 AD. And when Nero offered funding to rebuild this big, powerful city, they declined it. And said, no, nah, we've got our own money. We're rich enough. We'll rebuild our own city. That's how rich these people um, uh, the place was so influential that uh, one of the, the um, uh, meetings to talk about biblical canon or what books of the Bible are accepted and true to be put into the Bible, the Word of God, was actually held there at Laodicea. This is a big place. This is a powerful place. And somewhere along the way, kind of lost it. Cooled off. And you know, I, I think we all see examples of that everywhere, where, where things have not quite gone too bad, but they're not as good as they really ought to be. 
Um, you know, uh, do you like it when someone half shovels the snow off your sidewalk? Gets it down to about that half inch of, of, of ice down there? That's not good enough. You know, um, uh, would you like it if when you went in for an oil change, they, they took out about two quarts of oil and said, yeah, that's good enough, and we put a couple, couple quarts of oil on top of it. No, that's not good enough. That's the same thing Jesus says. It's just not, you know better. It's not good enough. Um, I see that as a, as a school teacher. Uh, some of my, my students at times they don't exactly meet standard. They don't really meet expectations. But you know, you know the game, right? We've all been students. The, the, the school thing is, well, if I'm just a little bit disobedient, if I, if I do some of my homework, I can let it slide and pass. If I, if I kind of study for some of the tests, surely I can pass. I'll get through it. Those of us who have finished a particular grade level, we realize that's really not the way to do it, is it? Good enough. I'm at the elementary school, I remind, I have no idea how many people every day not to run in the hallways. <sighs> kind of goes like this, imagine, okay, we got a short person, and they run through, and say, hey, 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 please walk. So they do that. I'm not really running, but I'm kind of shuffle walking. I start my class and I say, all right, class, here's what we're going to do. Please listen up. And, and so instead of shouting out, yeah. there's a sound away. This weekend, I think I'm going to go. Wait, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, you know what I'm saying. Set my alarm for 6.20 and push snooze and get up about 6.30 or 40 or 50. <laughs> it's probably not good, is it? That's being halfway. Um, you know, um, in, uh, in the Star Wars movie, in, in The Empire Strikes Back, there's a, uh, a thing, a famous thing where Luke Skywalker is training with his mentor Yoda, and, and Yoda says, uh, tells him to do something or try something, and, and he says, well, I'll try, and Yoda says, no, there is no try. It says, do or do not. There is no try. Don't halfway try. You know, the, the, the word says, because you say I am rich and I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing. But, but you don't know that, that, that you're so, so self-centered. You, you think you're self-made. You think you have pulled yourselves up from your bootstraps. And you just aren't. You're not all that. Jesus says, do a thing. Or don't do it. You say you're rich, but you're not. You say you don't need anything. We know the, the, the book, The Emperor's, uh, what is it, Emperor's New Clothes? Where at the end, you know, the idea is the emperor has no clothes. And Jesus says, look at yourself, emperor. Look at yourself. You're naked. Come to me. Come, come and get some clothes from me. So not only that, he says, come get white garments, fresh, new, clean, spotless. Come to me. Let's, let's get this fire going again. Um, it talks about gold, okay? It um, talks about gold refined by fire. I know I am not a gold dealer, but, but I know enough that when I go to a, a, a jewelry store and I'm looking at jewelry and it says 24 karat gold, I know that that's pretty pure. I don't know exactly how that works, but it's pretty pure. I know the difference between that and a rock out of the street that has some gold paint on it. I know that, that, that a diamond ring that says 24 karat gold, genuine stones, and, and comes from a reputable place is going to be valuable. I know that someone who comes up and says, Psst, hey, buy this big chunk of gold. Yeah, it's not been refined. It's not been tried. It's not had the impurities taken out. Jesus says, come to me. Let me take out the impurities. Let, let me give you a, a white robe, spotless. Let me give you some riches. Let me, let me warm up your lukewarmness. Verse 19, after all that chewing out, verse 19 says, remember, this is for you. I only correct those that I love. It's 
because I love you that I want you to be better. It's because I love you that I want you to, to notice yourself. It's because I love you that I want you to pay attention. Again, thinking of... Uh, me in, in classrooms, I don't know how many times I have said um, in, in the last 20 some years of teaching, um, hey class, this is for you, not for me. I've already passed the class, right? I've already passed third grade math. This all works for you, not me. I've already passed eighth grade social studies. This is for you, not me. I'm, I'm going to help you out for you, not for me. And verse 20 is our, is our very often quoted Verse, behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? Well, a lot of times talk about this knocking thing, that, that Jesus is knocking and knocking and trying to get our attention. It's just whoever answers, he's knocking. What are doors for? Doors keep things in, doors keep things out. Uh, a couple of verses ago, we read that, that Jesus said, I open doors that nobody can shut. Well, if he can open doors that nobody can shut, why does he need to knock? I should just come in. But it's that soft, gentle call. You know, he starts with behold. Pay attention. Look. Then he says, if anyone, stand in here, and I'm calling, if anyone will come, if anyone will come, then I'll rush in. I'll share a meal. Okay, now, um, uh, Where's, where's the application for us here? Because you're saying, preacher, um, I've heard the call of Jesus, came to church, stayed awake, tolerated your awful coffee, tolerated your bad jokes. What more do you want from me? Well, it's not me. What does Jesus say? Are you hot or are you cold? Or are you lukewarm? Because just like the people at Laodicea, we have a danger that we become um, self-confident. We're sure of ourselves. Got my little cross medallion. Got my little membership card. I've got my Bible. Doesn't even have a whole lot of dust on it. I can quote a verse or three. Surely that's good enough, right? None of that is listed in Scripture. What is listed? Jesus says, follow me. What is listed? And the scripture says, pray about all things ceasingly. What is listed? It says, keep these words on your mind at all times. Study them. <coughs> what is listed is, let me show you I love you. That's this whole giant love letter. It says, hey, if anyone will come to the door and open it up, I want to show you how much I love you. Let me tell you about it. Let me, let me show you about this. Now, um, you know, it's so easy to become a self-made person, to be proud of ourselves and say, well, this is good enough. Like we were talking in the kitchen. Uh, I know the, the coffee was yesterday. I was asked, well, what, what kind of coffee is that, Pastor? And he said, well, it's folders. Okay, that's good enough. Is there better coffee? Sure. Is there worse coffee? Yeah. Well, how old is it? Is, is there any impurities in it? Is it... It'll be tolerable. It'll be all right. I got used to it. Yeah, so did the latest seeds. Jesus says, I wish you were cool and refreshing, or I wish you were hot. But you're in the middle. Get off the fence. And that's where I think is our call to action is we need to look at ourselves and say, Am I on fire for Jesus? Am I so attuned to the word? That Jesus and I, we're, we're like this. We're, we're eating together. He didn't even have to knock on the door. He, he just walks right in. It's like, hey, you know, you know you're here. You're here. You're walking among us. You're with me. You are, you are inside. You have come to inhabit my heart. We're so close. You don't even have to knock. Okay, sometimes he does. Sometimes he says, hey, preacher. Hey, you hear me knocking? Hey. There's this, there's this little door over here that, that maybe is closed to me. It's this little area of your life. I'd like to come in and clean that up. Let me give you a white robe. But I'm right here and I'm calling. This is behold, notice, listen up, look around. Guess what? I'm calling. Hey, I'm over here. Look over here. Look at me, look at me, look at me, Jesus says. Look at me, look at me, look at me. If anyone will come. Jesus 
says, if there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am around. There I am in your midst. There I am with you. He says, that's what I want. So I, I don't know where we are today. I don't know where, where you are today. Are you on fire? Have you let that cool off? Are you kind of kind of hanging out, put your feet up and, and chill out a little bit and let some, some other things kind of unfold, got a little busy? I think this is a call to action, a call to self-examination, that, that we need to, to do a self-examination and find, where am I lukewarm? Do, do I need to put this in the microwave for about 45 seconds? That would improve it. Where, where do I need to, to be a little bit less self-satisfied because we know all glory belongs to God, all blessings come from God. I didn't do it. Or maybe, just maybe what we see here is that we're, we're to share that light, to share that warmth, to, to spread the gospel. There's an idea. To share the light of Jesus. There's an idea. That's biblical. Because see, if we're awake and aware and we're sharing a meal with Jesus and there's someone standing outside and they're starving and they're cold and they're naked, you know, Jesus said, even those who offer as much as a cool glass of water to others have done it in my name, has done it as those serving me. You know, I don't think, I don't think that the purpose of believing in Jesus is just to sit down and gorge ourselves in a meal with him and close that door that he opened. I think Jesus is about open doors. I, I think if Jesus um, came and said, hey, preacher, I'm knocking, can I come in? And I say, yeah, sure, come in. And we look outside and we see someone else. I don't think Jesus would say, well, I'm sure I'm glad to be here. Let's eat. I think Jesus would, would have me say, uh, pardon me, Jesus, hang on, go get this other guy. Go get this other girl. Let me, let, let me go share some of this because he, he's knocking for them too. And what about the place where we find that we're not quite up to snuff, that we've cooled off? Jesus says, if anyone will turn to me. Now, um, I, I want to tell you, there, there are going to be some hard things. There's going to be some tough things, some unfortunate things, some unfair things. And remember, Jesus is with us. He loves us. He wants to be with us no matter what. I am so encouraged to see reports that even in Ukraine, even in the midst of a bombing and fighting and tanks, that people are praising the Lord because that is that, but this is Jesus. That's being on fire. Can we praise Jesus in a storm? Can, can we be so focused on him that our momentary inconveniences don't, don't distract us at all. Or, or are we really on the fence between, okay, Jesus, I really want to eat with you. Hey, look, something shiny. No, Jesus, I, I really want to be here. Oh, look, hey, what's this over here? Now, I, I have some preacher friends that do this, and I give them a, give them a hard time because they say, wow, I'm dizzy. I'm just playing ping pong with you. Do we do that? If so, do or do not. Don't try. Because Jesus says, if anyone opens the door, I'll come in with them now. We're about to go into the, the season of Lent where we, where we think about celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. What better time to share that love of Jesus with somebody else? What better time to, to find someone who maybe has cooled off and say, you know what, I, I want to warm you up. Uh, let, me, let me bring you to the master. Let me bring you to Jesus. Now realize we don't have to do the work. We just bring someone to the door and let them open it. Let Jesus do the work. We don't have to talk. We don't have to, to do it other than to help someone find the door that Jesus is knocking on. What a great time to do that. I challenge you that this season leading up to Easter, that, that you pray for opportunities to help someone else open that door, that not only would, would we each grow closer to Jesus, but that we would help someone else to catch that fire that maybe they lost, to find that fire for the first time. This week, pray for those opportunities. I, I want to close us today in prayer.
Pray a word with me, please. Lord, we come to you today thankful for your word, which says that, that you love us. That even when you correct us, that you love us. Lord, thank you for continuing to love us, for being patient. Now, Lord, help us as we turn our attention to others. Help us, Lord, to not only uh, catch fire for you, to not only grow closer to you, but to lead others to that door where we know that you are knocking, that if anyone would answer, that you will come in with them and you will share a meal. Lord, we ask that you would help us to search our own hearts. Clean anything that is not of you. Help us to, to walk with you. Help us to know those areas where we need to open a door and allow you access to our entire life. And Lord, in all that we do, help us to glorify your name. Lord, be with us as we go this week, that we would look like you, that we would have your words, that we would know what actions we should take and that we would glorify you and point others to you. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining me today. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope you can find someone else to bring to Jesus, to open that door. And then I hope to see you again next week, either here in the sanctuary or, or on the internet. Have a great week and be